Hey, good morning, guys. Welcome to the Prelude for episode 16, which we feature a long-standing member of the trading community, PAX, uh, Chicago um, resident, a big uh, pit trader back in the day, and then eventually moved into the world of trading on screens. It's a really interesting opportunity for me to talk with somebody who's been around for such a long time and has those stories. And it's always cool to hear what that world used to be like, the comparisons between, you know, then and now, what carries over, what doesn't. And I think you guys will enjoy hearing from Pax and some of his stories, and you can get a lot of actionable items out of this episode. Um, I don't introduce him. We just started talking and recording and uh, we were just, we we're already just kind of shooting the shit. So no introduction here. And we're just going to roll right into the conversation. So enjoy, and I hope you learned yeah. something. Yeah, my favorite saying is like, keep your seat at the table, right? Just the ability to be in the game is so powerful. But it, I admit it can get it can get frustrating with the long spurts of just vol just compressing and compressing. And, and you know, you're, you're really reliant sometimes as a, as a scalper like me, like on these... Ukraine situations or the Middle East or some tail event. Um, you know, I've learned, I've learned over time how to grind out a winning as well in any environment. But like, I admit this has been my most difficult. It's my 10th year. It's been my most difficult year because huh. threats of these big moves um, trap me into holding on to trades a lot longer than I'm normally doing because I feel like, Oh, I've found something that's about to happen. And they just oscillate back and forth and kind of been chopping me out all year and adjusting to that has been a really, it's yeah. been a new ball game. All I don't right, know so, how you feel about it. Okay. So that, that is, that, that's the mark of a good trader. I, I like when I do these things because I can oftentimes tell who's real and who's not. And that's real. Um, you know, and you've had, you, I, so the, the biggest weakness that I've had in my career is from from the, the, the I don't know how much you know about my past from um, I was a big trader in the NASDAQ pit now a really big trader in the NASDAQ pit. And, you know, from being a big trader that moved the NASDAQ 100, 200 points by myself, you know, to being a screen trader trading five lots and 10 lots and things, you know, the um, what the fuck was my I, I lost my train of thought. Oh, the, uh, my biggest weakness was always looking for too much out of the market. I trade breakouts. I trade the opening range breakout every morning, uh, and and I'm long that, short this. I was on the floor. When I struggled on the floor, I started the fade rallies and started the fade breaks, and you know I was picking tops and bottoms and getting run over. But um, and then after I went broke after MF Global in 2011 and started over again, I went back to the opening range. So I don't. The the way that I trade out, I trade S and P primarily. I trade 30 year bond a lot. And, and crude a lot, uh, but spoos primarily. So I trade in quarter units. So the 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 I don't I'm not a scalper, uh, but I you know this morning I'm short for most six seventy five. So I the the bottom of the opening range forty uh, forty four oh six seventy five. So I pay for my trade. I buy one. If I sell four, I don't trade four, but I trade out in quarters. So it's easier to illustrate. So I sell four. I buy quarter a twenty five percent of my unit in at what I call the pain line, four points from the opening range. So this morning was, was 02, 0275. And then I have targets that I, that I, that I predetermined before the market opens that I'm going to take profit at. The, the first target was 94. So I sold 0675s. I removed my risk at 0275. So now I'm, I'm short uh, three quarters of my unit. I take profit on another quarter at 94. And my next target was 43.78, which I took profit at there too. And underneath 78, I'm going to sell more, which I did. So if the market stopped at 94, and the market stopped at 94 and retraced back up to 05, doesn't get back inside the opening range, so it doesn't trigger my stop. I'm still short. It, that doesn't make me want to trade back and forth. It doesn't. It doesn't entice me to hurry up and buy someone I shouldn't. You know, my stops are in. I paid for the trade. I removed my risk. I took profit. I'm satisfied with with what I've made on the trade already. I'm not going to continue to bang back and forth. The market's going to either come down to 78, put money into my pocket, or it's going to scratch me out for, you know, a small profit, right? If I sell a four lot, that's, I'm up 1,200, 1,400. That's a good day. So um, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sell 4378s and double my size 
and have it go up to 85 or 90. I'm going to sell 78s as I did at the opening range, and that's going to be a completely new trade. So now I'm short 0675s. I've taken profit at 94. I take profit at 78. I sell a full unit underneath 78. I'm right or right out on every trade I make. So if that market stays offered 78, I pay for it and I take profit at 61, which was my next target, which I did, you know, and I'm still short those. So that that way, if the market extends through and and, and we get a swing trade back down to 4187 or a trench, you know, a, a trend trade change, uh, not change, but a trend trade down to 3912 or something, I'm still short and I can add using the opening range of my targets. If the market stops here, comes back to the 78 scratch. Paid for the trade, removed my risk. I took profit on it, 61. I scratch out the rest. I'm still satisfied with what I made, and I and and I still have shorts on for most 675 that I have to now decide how I'm going to manage. So I don't I don't sell what I all that to say, I don't sell them in the hole anymore and hope that the or expect that the market is going to extend through. So I don't get it shoved back in my face. Mm -hmm. I write a write on on every trade. So if I sell them, and, you know, and and the market doesn't extend and it becomes the hole. I just get out quickly and I'm still short normally from above or long, depending on what the case may be. So, so what brought you to, cause I'm always interested in like what, what led to that strategy becoming so good for you, right? Like why, why do you feel the need to, and look, I do this as well. Uh, for me, I'm not a guy who loves risk. I'm uh, very good at holding winners and I'm very good at taking quick losers. That's, been my style for years. It's what makes me comfortable. It's why I sleep at night and it's why I can go golf in the afternoon or wh whatever it is I'm going to do. Why is it that you like to remove the risk from the table? Does it allow you to think clearer, to, to maneuver your day better? Uh, what, what, what's like driving you to have that as a strategy in the first place? So uh, on the trading floor, I, you know, I was part of uh, the bigger traders that moved the market. And the smaller guys would just kind of jump on board, you know. So if I got long out of the opening range, the NASDAQ was good for eight points out of the opening range every day. So I, I would pay for my trade at eight points. And then the ranges started to expand. You have to go back and look at a historical chart going back to the late 90s, early 2000s. We went from ranges with 20 points and, you know, volume of 5,000 contracts a day. And this is the big NASDAQ. This is when we were $100 a tick. Um not not you know the minis or the micros so then ranges started to expand to 30 40 50 points 100 point 200 points and then you know with the with the tech bubble and the tech bubble burst and my god it was three four hundred points limit down days every single day and we controlled the volume so if i'm long from the opening range i pay for my trade i have no risk on it because remember too in nowadays we have i trade s p not nasdaq so much but the you know i've got access to every tick so it, when I was on the floor in the NASDAQ, we can, we can move 50 points and there wouldn't be a one lot traded, you know, or 100 points. And I'm long 50, 50 big ones or, you know, 20 big ones, which would be 200 minis. You know, I've got 20 on and, and, and nothing is trading. You know, mm -hmm. I, I got to get out. On the screens, I've got access to every tick. So I want to use that access. But what made me comfortable holding positions was removing my risk. So at, at, the, at the very least, I'm going to break even on the trade. So at that point, I can stay out of the noise of the market. I don't care about the, the, the back and forth, five, 10 points movement before the market des decides that it's going to extend the range. I don't care about that. I paid for my trade. I can sit that out. The market is either, the, and there's no point in me staring at the screens either. I've got my stops in. I go work out. I, I, I'll go play golf. Um, you know, I'll go do things. I OCO my orders and I leave. The market is literally going to either stop me out or it's going to come down and pay me. Staring at the screens isn't going to help me. I remove my risk. The four things, things I call the four pillars of capital management is number one, I minimize my risk. So if I sell 0675s, that market needs to stay offered below that, that level. And my risk is minimized because I'm going to put in a, once the market goes a point in my favor, I put in a scratch stop. So now the market, now, then the second part, part of that is to remove my risk. So I remove my risk by paying for my trade. Then the third part is the best part of trading, which is man managing my profit. So I want to I want um, to uh, maximize my profit by trading at predetermined targets and only at predetermined targets. And then I want to exploit my profit by looking for places to add to it by using the profit that I've got locked in to make more. So 
on every trade that I make, I want to be able to execute the four pillars of capital management. If I don't, I'm going to scratch the trade or I'm going to take a small expense on it. I don't hold things very much. Um, I, I mean, I'll hold I'll hold things price wise, but I'm not going to hold things against me. If I sell those 675s and it's 08 bid, I'm already out of that. I'm not waiting for it to go 09 bid or 010. I'm out for a, a couple of ticks. So it helps well, me. Gonna... Helps me hold on when I pay for my trade and I take profit on it. It helps me hold on to the trade until the market gets to one of my price levels. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I resonate very much with that. Um, I, I personally feel a uh, clarity, I suppose, because I'm not, I don't have the weight of the risk or whatever anymore in my head. And now I can just, I can look forward now rather than worrying about what's behind me. Right. Me too. Uh, so, I'm assuming that you have reasons for where you're putting those those outs um, along the way. In in today's environment, has this been a, a, a way you take outs for a very long time, or are you constantly kind of adjusting based on the regime of where you're looking to execute those profits, right? Higher volatility, maybe you're extending those profits more. Lower volatility, you're taking shorter winners. Like, how are you adjusting? Yeah. You know, now I'm going to, you know, so my, uh, my, my initial targets are going to be about 15 points away from the opening range. The s and is kind of rotating in 15 point ranges, you know, from the OR. So I'm going to take profit on a quarter of my unit at 15 points from there. And that's, that's enough for me to be able to, to, to sit through whatever the market is going to do. If we come back up into the, if I'm stuck, if we're stuck in an environment with an ATR of 25 or 30, then when we get down to that to that first target, I'm going to take more than a quarter of my unit off. I might flat. Um, if we're if we're in a, an environment today, our ATR I think was 48 or 50, and and that's only in the last week the ATR was 60. You know we had a, we had a, a, a average range of 60 points during the trading day. Um, I'm going to take profit at 15 points, but I'm only going to do it on a quarter of my unit. I'm going to let the market move. You know one thing I know is that the market is going to move. It's going to do something. And I know that when I when it does do it, I'm going to keep my expenses tight, manageable. But I'm going to I'm going to reap the rewards of, of managing my profit effectively. So I'm going to stay out of the way of the market, like like I was trying to get to, you know, with the with the the smaller traders on the floor. When I bought them and I started the uptick, you know, I was long twenty. I bought another ten. I bought another ten. I bought another twenty. Now I got fifty on, and I'm upticking, you know, creating volume, painting the tape. These guys would buy the two lots and the three lots and the five lots that I didn't want. And I'd buy the 50 lots and the 20 lots. You know, we create, we painted the tape. The algorithms didn't. Human beings did. That's when trading was trading. And it was a lot of fun. Um, now the algorithms do it. So I need to stay out of the way of the algorithms. Like the smaller traders needed to stay out of my way. You know, I'd run them over. Like the algorithms will run me over. I'm a small trader now. I let the algorithms do the work. So I'm going to trade out in quarters, always trade out in quarters, unless the ATR is smaller. And after 15 points, I might flatten. I might take my, I might take more than a quarter of my unit off and leave something on to see if we extend for another 15 points. But that's it. You know, sometimes, sometimes with the ATR greater, I'm going to take more out of the market than I can. And I'm looking to leave a runner on, you know, I'm always trying to leave a runner on. Got it. Got to love the runner, you know, that's <laughs> what a big money is. It's right. That's right. So, you know, you mentioned a lot of the kind of previous era. You've seen a lot of eras now. Um, what are some of the things that are carrying over throughout all the eras? And then what's maybe the one difference you see that is now that was never a thing back then? And maybe you just mentioned it with the algos kind of running the show um, as opposed to maybe a, a human with size. But what are some of the kind of things that have you seen consistent throughout all of these kind of regimes throughout the decades? And then what's something that really pops out to your mind that like you never even saw coming? The, the most important aspect of trading for any of us, it doesn't matter who we are, is what we're bringing to the screens, you know? So what, whatever's going on in my life is going to play itself out on the screens. You know, I, um, um, I need to be something I tweet a lot about, be confident, carefree, fearless, and focused every day. That's, you know, determining what that is. You know that I am that is my my first uh, 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 my first um, way of determining what kind of size I'm going to trade or how I'm aggressive I might be in during that day. So being aware of who I am, self possessed, self aware, self confident. Um, you know, so whether we're on the screens or whether we're on the floor, 
I had to be those things and I had to be in touch with myself. If I came on, if I was under pressure to make money, um, you know, and I was scared, I, I needed to pay my mortgage out of my trading account and I didn't have the money already set aside, you know, more than likely I wasn't going to trade well. I was going to, I was not going to manage my risk well and I sure as shit wouldn't manage my profit well. So I think that just understanding who we are and the human aspect of trading is for us as, as discretionary traders or for me as a discretionary trader is more important than anything else. Um, you know, so it's, it's knowing myself and, and being in touch with myself and being self-possessed and self-controlled and self-confident that is most important. And then, you know, I think the, the, uh, um, Computers started to generate the majority of the volume in side-by-side -side trading in probably like 03, you know, and 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 I was slow. Uh, I had a long tweet about this this weekend about um, about the changes in business that got a lot of attention. Um, I was slow to react to that, you know. I fought the algorithms taking control, or I fought I fought computers, the minis taking control of the market, uh, and and uh, I didn't I didn't go on a headset. I didn't go, you know. A lot of guys were on a headset, uh, um, hooked up to somebody who was on a tr on a computer screen, so they were flipping the arb, you know, between the pit and the screens. I didn't do that. I tried to crush the arb with my own money, you know, and that's that's a bad idea. Uh, I tried to fight the, the the big screen traders, and that's a bad idea. And then eventually, computers computers started to generate the majority of the volume, so that even made the the screen traders obsolete. You know, so so and we all fought that. Everybody fought that, and, and so many so many very very wealthy traders went broke doing that. They never learned how to adapt. So eventually, after I had gone into the hog pit, I had had enough. I started my own prop group um, in Chicago. And uh, that failed in 08. My mother died. My sister died, and my mother, my mother, my sister, my mother died in June of 08, and my sister in November of 08, and my mother-in-law in March of 09. And in between that, our three and a half year old son, who's now 18, was in the hospital for a month and a half with pneumonia and um, viral meningitis. So um, my prop group failed. I wasn't there to manage it, and you know the world fell apart. Uh, you know, investments went away, just all kinds of bad shit. So I went into the hog pit to, to try to, you know, get my feet back under me and to build up some more capital again. And I did, and I was fine. Um, and the, the, the business continued to change, right? And I didn't quite change with it. I was still resistant to the change. I would go up and trade on the screens and, uh, and I was still thinking I was a market maker. And I'm not a market maker anymore. I'm a market taker. I need to let the algorithms take me to where they're going. So I would fight the algos and still try to impose my will on the market, and it can't do that. So after MF Global happened in Mar uh, October of 11, and I, I ended up swinging six figures a day and, and just completely blowing me, myself and family out of the water financially and having to start all over again from square one, one lot, two lot trader again, um, that's when I started to stay out of the way of the algorithms. That's when I started to let the algos do the work for me. Um, that was difficult to do. Because, you know, but that's when I became a market taker. You know, it's a, it's a silly line, but it's true and not a market maker. By the way, a shout out to the hogs market. I, I still trade lean hogs every day. It's a, it's one of, one of my uh, bread and butters. But it's, it's interesting to hear you uh, hear you talk about that. I feel like there's this this old packs and this new packs, right? And, and when you mentioned earlier, you know, um, I'm very much a body aware person, right? Like when, when I'm, when Me things too. are going well, everything feels great when things are going poorly all sense of all sorts of sensory overload need to go work out all that whereas some people go more internal right? right but um when i hear you say like how you approach each day how you're feeling how your how your mindset is and that's going to dictate like how you're coming into the markets and like what you're pushing you know what sizes you're putting on and whatever it's almost like that's a complete shift to the other side of the spectrum from what you might have been prior to that, because it sounds like you had this, you had this struggle with your ego essentially to accept that things are changing, right? And luckily, before you absolutely killed your career, you you hung on by a thread and said, you know what? Okay, I'm fine. You got it, man. You got it. You win. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to win now in this new environment rather than still fighting the old environment. So I'm guessing you were like the probably the opposite of what you are now. Because it seems like you're very much like, however I come into the markets, I'm going to accept that and, and I'm going to use that to my advantage rather than trying to like 
force the pound the table type of mentality, oh, which worked for you for a long time, right? It, it did work for me for a long time. Well, we controlled it. Yeah. But even on the screens, I'd sell a hundred lot and then start down ticking with, you know, it, 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 like, like as if that's going to do anything. It was ridiculous. What the hell am I going to do? And I'm back, <laughs> back 10, 15, 20 points later after I average in, you know, so sell more for five points, 10 points. Mm -hmm. If I liked them at 80, I'll like them at 85. I'll love them at 90. And I puke <laughs> them at 95, you know, not, not anymore. I'm puking them where I should have been selling them in the first place. How many times have we done that? Mm. Oh yeah. What, like when you're, when you're in person, can you, I'm trying to envision how this works, but like in a way it's almost more like poker in which you can, you can often see a little bit more of your competition, I'm guessing, right. You can, you can maybe feel the intentions of people a bit more. Whereas like in hogs or whatever, if you sell a hundred lot and you, it, it goes in your favor a little bit, but then it starts going the other way. You have no idea what type of entity or what type of intention is behind any of that. Right. That's could be somebody that's playing against you. It could just be somebody knows some, fucked up hog story that just occurred right like you don't on the really floor, know you, knew it. you know on the floor right on the floor in the hogs you knew what what the producers were doing you knew what the funds were doing you knew what they were you knew what which way they were positioned in the spreads you knew what they were going to be do how they're going to how are they going to hammer the the front month and 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 push the back month a little bit higher to get the spread out of whack to cut their margins out. you knew what that was going to do you know so if i'm short the front month and i knew that the uh, uh the 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 two biggest brokers slash order fillers are going to come in and sell the shit out of it for you know a, a, a hundred points i'm going to stay short and i'm going to give my order to a broker to get out and cover them on the close they're going to and you know i mean just little things like that when i was in the nasdaq pit i one of the things that made me such a great floor trader is that i uh, a bunch of things but one of them is i can take in a ton of information and i can act on it deci decisively so with my right eye i'm watching five traders, my left eye, another five traders. I'm listening to 10 guys with my right ear and 10 guys with my left ear. I knew who was long, who was short. I knew who was likely to add and who was likely to puke. I knew what the funds were doing. I knew what the banks were doing. I knew what, what side they're positioned on. And I, you know, obviously I knew what the market was doing relative to the opening range that day. And I knew what we were likely to do. So I knew what my job was, you know, if I was long evens and I wanted to, I wanted to take profit at a half, and between even and a half, there were 1,500 contracts, you know, to, to be cleaned up. Well, it was my job to clean them up. You know, so if I'm long 50 and I want to sell 50, I got to buy all of that other stuff in between that. Or I need to entice other traders to do it as they're trying to entice me to do it. You know, it, that shit's not going to clean itself up unless the banks come in and start buying. And the banks come in and start buying that small stuff. Now we're really going to propel higher. So now I know I know who's long, who's short. I know that I'm long evens and I want to sell halves, but I know when we get to half, the, the banks are coming in, Goldman's buying them, Witter's buying them, Bear's buying them, you know, all of these companies out of business. We get up to half. I'm not taking profit there. I'm adding more. I'm buying more, hmm. you know, because I know that these guys are going to keep buying. And I know that all of these hedge funds are short. So eventually they're going to have to start puking and we're going to rally another 150, 200 points. When we went onto the screens, you couldn't see that. In the very beginning of Globex, you, you were able to see who the counterparty was. So if I sold 20 at even and you bought five, um, you know, and then, you know, five other people or three other people bought five, 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 you know, I can see James bought five and what house Geneva, I don't know what, what house number Geneva is, but, you know, what house is Geneva? And, okay, so two, four, eight and Goldman is three, five, zero and, and, you know, Shearson, two, three, five, I think they were. Um, you know, I knew who the counterparty was. And then the Merck changed that because, the, you know, banks didn't want that. Yeah. Eventually, it became completely anonymous. You don't know who's long. You don't know who's short. Market profile and volume profile tries to reconcile that, but it can't. Not in the age of algorithms. Pete Stottlemyre tried to do that in 08 and 09. And I was one of the two traders that traded for him when he tried to update market profile and, you know, to try to determine who's doing what, why, what, when, why, where, and how you can't determine that anymore. It's, it's almost impossible yet people still try to do that. You know, the markets are going to do what the markets are going to do. And it's very difficult to tell who's long or short, especially when 90 to 95% of the daily volume is created by computers. Mm -hmm. It's not computer. It's not people. So how am I going to know who's long or short Tr trades are happening quicker. Trades are happening quicker than the speed of light. There's, there are a thousand reasons that trades are being put on before I can even see it. I'm going to try to determine, you know, who's long and short in that. No, 
I'm just going to stay the hell out of the way of it. And I'm going to let the market take me to where it's going. And like I said earlier, it's going to scratch me out or it's going to put money into my pocket, but I'm not going to lose money doing it. Yeah. So my, it's more of a game now of looking, looking at yourself, right? Like you don't, you don't have the competitors anymore to, to play games with. You have to play games with yourself and figure out, right. How you're reacting to things. So I'm interested, like, cause you had all these noises coming in, right? You're, you're picking out what's important, what information's relevant, how I'm going to size this, how I'm going to exit, you know, so-and-so is positioned this way. Okay. I remember that this person's positioned that way. How can I best navigate now with none of that? Like, <laughs> what are the noises? Like, what are the whispers, you know? And that, like, how, what are those pitches being pitched to you in, in these days? You know, it's hard, hard to answer that question. I know, but what are there, is there anything that jumps out to you as the noise that is important to you now, uh -uh. or is it more just your own noise that's most My important. Own noise. I've got a plan coming into the day and I've got a system to trade it. And I stick to it and I and, and I, I stick to my plan. I don't I talk to there's um uh, a trader Ira Harris. I don't know if you, you know who Ira is. Um he's he was on the board of directors at CME group for a long time. He's managed hedge funds, he's an independent trader, he's a um he's a macro analyst, macro trader. He's older, he's 70, but still trades every day. He eats what he kills, as he says. Ira is the only um, macro voice that I truly listen to and internalize. I've known him for 30 years. Um, I trust his, his research. I trust him. And, and so I will get his opinion. Um, but that's it. You know, I, I know like today, 4409 is a pivotal area for me in the S&P. I tweeted these prices out the other day. Above 4409, then we go to 4453 and then 4491. Below 4409, the market wants to go back to 4378. And underneath 4378 to 4324, underneath there, back down to 4187. I know that that's going to happen. Or we're going to trade in a range. You know, we're going to trade from 09 down to 4378 and then bounce around in that range. In which case, the opening range will give me some profitable trades or it won't. I'll go work out, you know, but I caught them today and that's all I need, you know. Um, if I catch a 10 point trade tomorrow, great. If I catch a five point trade, that's good too. If I catch it, uh, well, I don't catch five point trades, but if I pay for the trade and scratch it out and I don't take another one, that's fine. I don't, I, I'm not going to Twitter to get everybody's opinion of the market. Um, I give mine, but I'm not going to get others. I don't talk to, to a bunch of traders and try to get everybody else's opinion on what they think that clouds my judgment. That'll make me want to, 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 to second guess my levels or my targets. So I just stick to it. Last year, uh, a, a story to illustrate that. <laughs> I ran into this guy, uh, Mark Variano, MPV, who was absolutely maybe one of the top five traders I'd ever seen and ever known. He was a little bit older than I was, and he was also a local in the NASDAQ pit. <laughs> Our sons played travel baseball for the same program. This is actually during COVID when I first ran into him. And I was short. We're, you know, we're talking. We're, we're still trading. It was great to see each other. We're catching up. We're having fun. He's still trading. I'm still trading. You know, neither one of us are broke like so many other guys that we knew. And so we're just having that conversation. Um, you know, I said, I'm short. This is great. I love you know, COVID. I love trading COVID. Don't tell me. I don't want to know what your positions are. Remember on the, and I remember having this conversation with him on the floor. I don't want to know what you're doing. I don't want to know your opinions of the market. I don't need that to cloud mine. Hmm. I forgot about that, Mark. Thank you for reminding me. And that stayed with me. You know, I, 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 I don't care. I don't care. I don't listen to CNBC. I don't listen to The only time I would ever listen to CNBC is when Rick Santelli or Art Cash and talk. Other than that, everybody else is a waste of time. That's some, uh, some good wisdom right there. And I think it, it goes like, to me, it's having to go through following people, listening to people, and then losing to eventually realize, okay, like I'm here because of me. I have the strategies that sit well with me. Nobody else has the same time horizons. Nobody else sees the markets the same way. So why do I really care about trying to get some sort of sentiment read from a weird algorithmically driven uh, Twitter feed, you know? Right. It, it, it's it's only going to hurt or, you know, it's probably just going to only hurt you. I don't know where it's going to help you too often. You know, what drives me nuts is is when I see people, you know, uh, make these big, bold calls. Well, uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to 3,900. You know, everybody was talking about 4,200. We're going to 4,200. 
Okay, great, good. How many schmucks out there, underfunded schmucks out there are gonna start to go get short because some guy with 50,000 followers are telling them that the market is going lower? I I, I mean, I, I, I hope people aren't doing that, but I'm sure that there are. There's yeah. a lot. Yeah. There are, and that, that and that's disgusting because you know, fifty percent of the time they might, ten percent of the time they're right, the other ninety percent of the time they're not. You know, I, I I've had to learn how to let the market, you know, my opening range, you know, my process, my everything I do, dictate my trades and not my opinion, not even my opinion. I've got my opinion. I, you know, yeah. I, and it, but I don't tweet that. The other day I tweeted on two different scenarios for the end of the year. If we close above 44.91, if we get two closes above 44.91, then we could see all-time highs. We can see 48.08. If we stay below 41.91, then by the end of the year, we will at least see 41.87 again and possibly down to 3,900 where we opened up the year. Two different scenarios, two very different scenarios. No calls, no bold, you know, great call packs. I didn't make any calls. I have two scenarios that can play out and I'm going to use my opening range method to get me between those levels one way or the other. Yeah. You're and setting if, yourself guidelines, scenarios, probabilistically, you yes. know, and, and you're going, you're going within that. And that's cool. Like, yeah, you're right. Most people just are yelling out these tail events, right. With, with low probabilities. And then they're, I like to call them like word shape shifters in which even if they're wrong, yes. they're, they're so yeah. good at Twitter that they'll make yeah. you think they were somehow right. You know yes. what I mean? Yes. Double talk. They double talk their way all over the place. That drives me crazy and vague. Yeah. Well, I told you that we could have wrapped. You, you did not yeah. say that. You said we were going lower. Don't give me that shape shifting bullshit. Yeah. That's really good. The shape shifters. That's good. Yeah. And uh, so it, it, it took me a while to, because, you know, they also sound very smart, right? But it's another you know, thing. Like, are they managing money? Are they broke? Like you don't, you don't really know anything about it. No, you don't. And <laughs> you're right. People talk to sound smart and they, oh my Lord, I can't stand that. I can't stand. I talk about that all the time. L listen to them talk just to sound smart. What are they doing with their trades? You know, those laid out. I don't know. I don't know. Drives me crazy. Now there are some people whose opinions I, 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 I will go to. Like I said, Ira Harris is the only one whose, whose opinions I will, I, I, Ira with the Y, if you want to look them up is is really the probably the only opinion that i will actually take without having to to do my own research but there are other people whose whose opinions i take and i listen to i read and and then i'll go research my own you know see if it but you know a, another thing too james is is i really don't care what the macro picture is telling me until after i'm positioned you know like I, i'm short now if if we stay below 4378 we continue lower you know good great at that point, I care about why we're breaking. Yeah. But right now, I don't. If somebody would, if you ask me now, why do you think we broke today? More sellers and buyers. That's why. There's yeah. more That's it. Yeah. Now, you know, tomorrow, end of the day, maybe I do a little research to see why we're breaking. But I don't the, care. The price first, right? Price well, first. Price first, last, and I mean, always, always, always. Yeah. The order books. Uh... I'm so glad I get to look at order books every day because it'll often tell you like, man, something's just not, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, you know, the narrative or whatever is out there in, you know, macro world, it's not what I'm seeing on the tape. You know, it's not, it's not what I'm seeing in the order books. Right. Um, and, you know, so you, you obviously have some, some sources of information that you trust and whatever, and they probably fit well with, Packs, you know, they fit well with what you understand, how you operate. Part of what I'm doing here with with this invest with instinct thing is like, I want people to understand who they are as a trader, mm -hmm. and then how do I best now operate in that what I just figured out? Am I somebody who likes hates risk and likes long term safe stuff, and you know doesn't care about order book or technicals, and I just want to like save up money for thirty years and fuck trading, like? Okay, well, you're in a much different bucket than James, right. who is a two-minute lean hogs trader who's looking at order books and loves risk. You know, so once you figure that out, who like what are the sources now that may be better to like align with you? Who are the people that are like you? Are is it a Warren Buffett then? Right, like maybe it's that type of mindset that you need to start like aligning yourself with, because if you go out on Twitter. And you're that type of person, but you're listening to a guy who has a short time horizon is talking about these tail events. Like you're going to lose everything. 
you know, it's guaranteed. So like for me, when I hear you say that, it sounds like you have kind of found the sources that align with, with what you're doing and trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't want to cloud it. You know, there's, there's, I don't know, you know, there's, um, I've got a unique, a unique insight into how price moves because I used to move it. And, and, and so I know how that works. You know, I, 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 uh, um, if I didn't have a method or a system of trading, I, I, I can just simply, you know, I can see when price is exhaust, and, and I watch your book too. You know, as you can see, I can see when price is exhausting. I can see when, you know, when, when maybe a temporary high might be putting in, and I can trade off of that. But I don't. I stick to my method. I stick to my process all the time. I'm not going to veer from it, even though I might see something. Uh, um, and, and and again, you know, as far as information goes, the price first for me, and I really don't care what the story is until after the market goes. And then I'm going to go look at a couple of until after the market does what it's going to do. And I'll look at all kinds of different things. Normally, I'm going to I'm going to text Iron and say, what was that about? And, you know, last week, the rally. Why in the hell are we rallying? Did you see what the uh, what the what what the what the Treasury did? No. And he sent me some articles to read. Well, thank you. You know, for him, he's already doing that work. You know, for him just to send me something to read real quick that puts everything in perspective is is nothing more than a quick, you know, text. And I was I'm lucky I keep talking about him, you know, because he really is like my kind of go to. He's my macro mentor and somebody who I got to know. I didn't know anybody when I started in this business. I started off as a runner making minimum wage, $89 a week in 1989 after I graduated high school. But I knew when I stepped on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the second that I walked down to the floor that this, whatever this is, is for me. This is for me. This is great. I found my purpose, you know? And, and so um, I quickly found out, I, I knew that if I worked hard that I might earn a shot, but I had to, I had to find out who the people are to, you know, who, who the people that would uh, put somebody into the pit, either as an order filler or as a local, a local being an independent trader, who was going to back me and to be a broker or, or a trader. And so I started to say hello to those people, you know, good morning. Good morning, Ira. Good morning, Ira. He'd just look at me and, you know, who's this kid? But eventually he would start to say hello. He'd look at my, we all had little name tags, you know, that we got on the floor with hello. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hi, Ira. And. Hey, Ira, can I ask you a question? You know, why are the currencies, you know, oh, well, let me, and he loves talking about what he sees. And, you know, so I started to learn from him. And and uh, my my mentor, my trading mentor, the guy who taught me how to do technicals and how to, you know, how to see the market and, you know, taught me, he told me when I met him, I had $257 left in my account. When I started trading at NASDAQ, I started with $10,000. The guy that I had worked for for 10 years had backed me. But not not in not in a prop way. He backed me to, you know, put the T bill up so that I can trade. Just don't go debit. Um, seat lease was thirty two hundred a month. So I'm you know I got sixty eight hundred left in my account at day one. Um, Nasdaq was a hundred dollars a tick at that point. And I was uh, a newlywed. My daughter was. You better born. get it right. <laughs> I, I had no chance. I was bartending at night. It was it was a tough time. I met Judd. I had two hundred fifty dollars in my account. He said, "Listen, if you listen to me, I'll teach you a way to uh, I'll teach you a way to trade that'll work on the floor, off the floor, anywhere in the world, at any time in the world." What's the catch? You got to pay me a thousand a week. I can't pay you a thousand a week. My seat lease is coming up. I just paid my seat lease like three. Uh, I got three and a half weeks left. I said, "I got to pay my seat at the end of the month." I got two hundred fifty dollars in my account. And I'm bartending. How in the hell? Pay me at the end of the month. If you listen to me, you'll pay me at the end of the month. At the end of the month, I paid him. And I paid my seat lease. At the end of the second month of, of working with them, I quit my bartending job because I was making enough money to be able to pr provide for my family, my burgeoning family. After my first full year of trading, I made a half a million dollars. I bought my first house, you know, set one of those semi custom you know, uh, houses in a, in a subdivision with tiny little trees, you know. But there was my first house. I didn't even think that I'd have those, that, that, that ability to be able to do that. In the first full year of trading, I was a millionaire, you know, and it was it was off to the races. Then, of course, broke and drive an Uber when I was 40. But, you know, the shit between that was great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, life is, life is cyclical, right? As everything. <laughs> what up? So, you, you know, you were saying how you, um, you know, you, you kind of have this knowledge from experience of like, when you see momentum kind of taking off in a market because you used to create that momentum. Do you feel like you have any 
of those intuitions um, these days? Do you try to stay away from those? And just um, is there any ability to really feel that so much? Um, I think so. Yeah, I agree. It, to, to me, it seems maybe in certain environments, it's a little easier, obviously. But what do you feel out there, especially maybe these days? Are you, are you feeling anything or is it a lot of back and forth confusion? Well, so um, since like since um, since September, I've been uh, I'm 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 bearish in sentiment in the fourth quarter. Now, that's not saying much because I'm I'm a better short than I am along anyway. Uh, you know, so like today I was, I had, you know, I was aggressive and I took them down and I added to them at 78. I still have those. Like I said, you know, uh, um, last week I missed most of the rally, you know, in, in the equities, we rallied 200 points and I, I missed 180 points of it. I caught 20 on Friday, big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't lose any money either. So a week that I'm going to struggle is I'm normally going to miss a trade. You know, I, I, I say that I don't lose money cause I don't, I spend money. Sure. I spend money. You know, I spend, there are plenty of days where I spend more money than what I make. And it's just a mindset shift by saying that, that I don't lose money. I'm not a loser. You know, um, when I lose money, I chase money. But if I spend money, it's a business expense. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can have a business expense. This is a business. I'm not gambling. I'm not chasing money. I'm not trying to, you know. So if I don't feel it and if I don't see it, I'm just going to sit it out. Um, now, with the, the rally that we had changed my sentiment going into the end of the year, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I was completely flat until today. Uh, now, you know, if we open up tomorrow out of the opening range, I'll cover my shorts from uh, from 78 and from 0675. I'll take the profit. I'll take the money. So, you know, the opening range tomorrow is going to be my, 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 my tell pivot. If we open up below and we start to tail off, then I'm going to be very bearish, especially going into a Friday. So if we if we close out the week soft, then I'm going to stay short and we're going to trade back down to 4187 by next week or the week after. And then I think going into the end of the year, we see some downside volatility. But last week kind of changed that sort of mentality in my mind. I'm actually kind of leaning more towards the bullish side of things. Uh, we need to get above 4409 before I get really bullish. and We need to take out some of the, the, the confirmation levels to the upside. 4453 and 4491 before I do get very bullish. Hmm. Um, but I need to see how the market is going to trade for the next couple of days before I have before before I give any credence to my positions being my opinion. You know, and at that point, if 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 I'm short and the market does start to trade lower, I'll hammer it and I'll take advantage of it and I'll really do well. But if it doesn't, you know, okay, so what? I made a little money, it was great, and I'll stay flat till the market tells me otherwise. So that right there, that makes me think there's like, there's an intuition right there is something last week, you had this kind of idea, right? This, okay, this is kind of what I'm thinking. And then I'm going to execute my plan as normal. But this is generally what I'm thinking. But last week shifted for you, right? Like, there were some powerful days last week, I didn't catch any of it. I was I was kind of hands off on, on that. Um, what, what was it about that that like made you think a little bit differently is it is it too much too soon is it is it just the thrust of it like what what about that made you kind of change things in a way 4187 has been a pivotal 4187 the s&p has been a very pivotal area for me since june of 21 and um underneath when we came under i think uh mid-september when we came underneath the 44 handle you know, we got under, we finally got underneath 4409. Um, I'd have to look at a chart, but I think that's when we did. But then I targeted shorts down to 4187. And we, when we reached it a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I flattened up my shorts. So I was kind of neutral to that point. You know, I was trading the opening range intraday and getting stopped out of stuff and, you know, do, doing as I described earlier. Um, then last week, all of a sudden, you know, we, we rally, we rally off that level on Monday, we opened at 4165. We rallied, a, I forget what the high was, but the next day, um, Wednesday, we, we opened at 4220. This is Fed day. Yep. Opening range is 4220 to 4224. We kind of fudged around in that area until after Powell's speech. And then we rallied like, you know, I don't know, 60 points. And then we extended that rally. So it was the way that we did rally that ultimately was, um, uh, you know, we're not breaking, we're not going any lower, you know, that doesn't mean I, I was going to jump out in front of it and get long, 
just, you know, the break is over. We traded down to, we traded down to where we needed the trade to. We made a low, we got back above it. We're not going lower now. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm flat, so I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to wait for the next trade setup. And the next trade setup kind of happened today. Interesting. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It was, it was very just strong movement after setting kind of that fierce low. And then, um, yeah, it, it, it was just an impressive move overall. But so, okay, you, you also, and, and we'll wrap this up after a little bit here, but it seems like you enjoy trading. You know, you have these levels and you have either levels going to hold or we're going to surpass it. So you trade probably breakouts a decent amount. Now, yeah, so so breakouts are an interesting topic to me, right? Because as a as a trader, I feel like I've gone through so many different markets and 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 regimes that i see breakouts react in different ways for long periods of time like i i specifically remember in 2014 2015 like a couple years in soybeans every time a level would break it would thrust like 50 ticks right and and you start to catch on and you're like oh if i just buy through a level it's gonna like thrust 50 ticks and like you know whatever that's that's the trade of the time and of course, once you start doing that, it stops acting that way. And all of a sudden you get these false breakouts. And but then you're like, well, no, it's going to continue to do that. Or then you then you get wrecked there enough to where you start working bids behind the le- or working offers like behind the level to maybe catch a puke in which you play it back. To, like all these different strategies that you could do in these um, levels. So does that change for you at all? And what's it take for you to end up taking a look at your strategy and being like, hmm, this this maybe just isn't isn't really what's necessary right now. How do you approach that, or do you not? No, I don't. Um, it, it doesn't. So I don't look at time frames. You know, I'm not looking at a five minute or or a thirty minute or an hourly or a daily. You know, for breakouts, it's you know the the way that it works is this this morning's opening range in the S and P was forty four oh six seventy five to forty four oh nine half. So I'm going to be long above it and short below it. Every single day, the algorithms are going to use the same level to break out from. You know, now where it breaks out to, well, that's up to me to figure out. You know, so we, I'm going to be short below 0675 and I'm going to be long above 095 today in the S&P. And, you know, as I said earlier, we've got these 15-point rotations and we've got an ATR as of this morning or as of today of 48 points. So I know that we're looking for at least, you know, 30, maybe 40 plus points. If we have a breakout, you know, up to 50 points. Well, we got that today. We had a a 50 handle break from the opening range. So um, I'm going to continue to change trade that, you know, as the algos who create the, 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 the price momentum use the same levels to break out from. The trick is, is, is in the morning, you know, is, is to not take every false breakout. Uh, this morning we came out of the opening range. It was an easy day. We came out of the opening range in the very first attempt and never got back inside of it. You know, but m- most days aren't like that. Most days they sell those 675s, they go 07 bid. I sell those 675s again, 07 bid. Well, I can't sit there and just do that all day long. I'll die death of a thousand paper cuts. So I've got to eventually limit, you know, my round turns. So I've got, I, I, you know, I'm going to wait for uh, I, I, my like if I'm making more than four or five, if I'm taking more than four or five, this is an obvious thing to say. But if I'm taking more than four or five expenses in the market, I'm losing money. Right. So I'm going to set it aside after four attempts. I'm going to wait for the market to become obvious, either get to that first part that I call the pay line, the four points from the opening range or down to the first target before I take a short or on the upside. Same thing on the longs. So I'll get long above 4409 or 4414 or something and wait for the market to go. I do that all the time. Every single day, the market breaks out from the opening range. It doesn't matter what market you're trading. It doesn't matter what market, as long as it's a future market that has a regular trading hour and it has a high and a low and it has a close, I'll trade the opening range breakouts. It truly doesn't matter. And it's the same patterns day in and day out. Now, where the market goes, well, that's a different story. So I'm going to trade out quarter units. This, you know, If I sell the 16 lot, I'm going to trade out in four lots. I'm going to pay for it with the four lot. I'm going to take profit with the four lot. Now I'm short eight. We get down through 94. I'm short eight. I, t- I buy five or uh, four more at 78. And we go we go 78 offer. I'm going to sell another 16. I'm short 20. And what's my risk on the 20 lot? I've got none. I've got no risk on the 20 lot. Because if we go 78 bid, I'm going to get out of the 16 I just sold and keep the four that I've got for most 675. Yep. Makes sense. So you're willing, you're willing to churn a little bit 
around the price levels and and position wrong position wrong but like you, you understand at a certain point like okay this this isn't i'm not seeing something correctly i'm going to wait till the next setup right yes. which i feel like most people that you know that's a big issue is like either they're going to hold on to one position too long and get way too happy with it or they're going to take way too many attempts and just right. completely wreck themselves right so you have this ability to from what you've learned over time to be like okay this isn't the one right and so also to note like when i hear how you style your trading it's like it's like you've sharpened a blade over years and years and years to simplify it right like everybody's looking for these fancy fucking things um but everybody i talk to who's successful it's the kiss method right it just seems so simple even though you know we obviously we know it's a diff very difficult thing but in reality, it's it's like less is more. Less is the 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 less I trade, the happier I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Cool. So, anyways, I, I uh, checked out your website and stuff too. So, why don't you just kind of give people a brief? We didn't even do an introduction. Sorry, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll kind of record an introduction. We just started started going. So, um, why don't you just tell people who you are if they haven't seen you before, where they can find you? Obviously, easy to find on Twitter. But other than that. Well, you can find me on Twitter at PaxTrader777. Um, I've got a website of, uh, you know, I, I don't sell that and don't market it, but, you know, I've got a website if you want to check me out at www.thepaxgroup.org. Um, you know, I'm an independent local. I've been an independent trader since 1997, for better or for worse. Um, I've been a partner in an FCM. I've been my, I've owned my own prop group. Uh, I've been a huge trader in the NASDAQ pit, a small trader in the hog pit, and a smaller trader on the screens trading S&P, but you know, a happily married man of um, 19 years, divorced. I was married before, divorced after six years, and two kids from that marriage and remarried for 19 years almost. And we have um, three kids, so I've got five kids total. And I love being a dad. I love being a girl dad. I love being a dad to my sons, and I love being a husband to my to my wife. And 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 I love trading. That's my life. It's cool. It seems like all the the turbulence you went through in the middle of the career there helped you enjoy this part more 100 percent right. um 100%. Well, before we let you leave what's the you know i spent a lot of time in chicago where's your go-to restaurants what's your what's your uh, chicago alpha for all the people out there gibson's italia oh yeah that's a good choice go on there tomorrow for dinner um I, uh, oh italia the one on the river not the steakhouse yeah, talking, italia oh, yeah. Italia is better than the one the, the, than the one I rush. Gibson's Italia is the best in the city. It's fantastic. Huh? It is. Yeah. It is. I'm going there tomorrow. We're going to see um, uh, uh, Seinfeld. Jerry really? Seinfeld. Yeah, my brothers and I and a friend of ours are going to see Jerry Seinfeld. So we were talking about where to go for dinner, and I um, uh, I know one of the guys at Gibson, so I uh, at, at Italia, and I texted him, got us in, and got a table for four at five thirty. So it's going to be a good time. Wow. And Italia. it's uh, it's at the Opera House, Seinfeld. No, United Center. Oh, oh, well, yeah, of course. It's probably a big sell out there. Yeah. Oh, that'll be fun. That'll be a blast. Cool. Well, all right. Um, I hope to talk to you again at some point. I really appreciate you taking some time out. And uh, good luck out there getting these shorts on. And we'll yeah, see what right. happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens tomorrow on Monday. Have a great weekend, brother. Thank you for all right, Max. See you Thank later. You. Yeah.